Hi everybody, hope you're well. Today we'll read from a book titled Raw Concrete, The Beauty of Brutalism by Barnabas Calder, published by Penguin Books. I love raw concrete, the great outburst of large concrete buildings in the 1960s and 1970s, the style known as brutalism, thrills me. I love the unapologetic strength of these buildings and the dazzling confidence of their designers in making their substantial mark. I love the optimism they seem to embody, their architecture promising bullishly that new technologies can improve almost every corner of human life. Most of all, I love the way the buildings look, rough, raw concrete, streaked by rain and dirt, forming punchy abstract shapes, soaring cliffs of tower block and entire cities within cities. Brutalism is a controversial muscular term for a controversial muscular style. Brutalist buildings derive their aesthetic not from borrowed historical motifs, but from the proud flaunting of modern construction methods, especially concrete and up-to-the-minute facilities like central heating and passenger lifts. The best buildings of the 1960s bring back the elation which so many in Britain felt at the rapid and substantial improvements of the period. More than the music of the Beatles, more than the photographs of David Bailey, the films of Antonioni or the fashion of Carnaby Street, the architecture of the 1960s gives me a taste of the joy felt by so many at the fast-developing, ever-freer world of that most exciting of decades. I was not always such an admirer. Growing up in the 1980s and 1990s in a comfortable Edwardian suburb of London, concrete architecture represented everything which was frightening and other, urban motorways striking, roady and flanked by decaying buildings, reeking underpasses which seemed to have been expressly kinked to maximize the number of corners around which imaginary psychopaths could cluster and, above all, council estates on whose raised walkways and deserts of patchy grass nameless but horrible crimes probably took place almost constantly. My childhood views on brutalism were shaped by the attitudes of an older generation who had seen the 1960s and 1970s mass demolition of Britain's Victorian and Georgian architecture and mourned it. Concrete modernism was recent and had become associated with political corruption, rapacious developers, vanaglorious utopism and social failure. Brutalism suffers from architecture's curious dual status. Architecture is present everywhere and used by everyone, yet at the same time it is the least understood of the major arts. Special architecture is visited and marveled at on holiday, ancient temples, medieval cathedrals or the colorful cartoonish buildings of Antonio Gaudí. But the more recent structures that so many people use every day are perceived simultaneously as being banal in their ubiquity and as being too intimidatingly technical to understand. With almost no architectural education in schools, off the peg opinions, sweeping generalizations and unquestioned prejudices thrive and build strength from wide repetition. No style is as routinely victim to such adverse stereotypes as brutalism. Even in January 2016, when high-profile campaigns were being fought by residents' groups in the same London estates to keep their brutalist social housing, the Prime Minister felt that post-war estates remained a safe target for a 1980s-style banishing. Step outside in the worst estates and you are confronted by concrete slabs dropped from on high, brutal high-rise towers and dark alleyways that are a gift to criminals and drug dealers. He then went on to blame the 2011 riots on their residents. 
With these attitudes proving hard to shift, it can take courage to see the good things in front of our noses. Knowing a little about architecture can bring daily pleasure. What were the ideas and ideals which shaped it? What challenges were the designers up against? How do the built results embody the aspirations and priorities of clients and architects? The range and quality of buildings present in every British town and city is considerable, and our wealth of 1960s brutalism is the equal of anywhere on earth. Understanding a building's materials, the techniques which went into making it, and the historical context of its creation can transform an inarticulate and faintly threatening heap of concrete into an ingenious and elegant piece of artistic design and skilled construction craft. The uniform sobriety of concrete turns out, when you look at it more closely, to conceal a subtle gamut of textures and colors, beautiful in themselves, and a permanent record of how the building was made. And in this tough, uneffusive material, the best brutalist architects were capable of producing landscapes more powerfully expressive than anything ever built before or since. Ask for the book at your local bookstore. Thank you for watching and see you in the next video. Bye.